Hello, good morning, everyone. Time for our second talk. And this one's going to be Andrew Godwin telling us what programmers can learn from pilots. I'm guessing a lot because flying a plane seems hard, but we'll hear it from him. Uh, let's uh, welcome him. Hi there, everyone. Uh, this is an interesting talk, so I hope you enjoy it. But first of all, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Andrew. I am a Django core developer, and I wrote the Django migrations, before that, South migrations. I'm a senior software engineer at Eventbrite, and very relevant to this talk, I'm also a private pilot in Europe and in the US. I also love cheese, because who doesn't? But first of all, I'm here to talk about planes. Now, planes are naturally very dangerous. In fact, if you think about it, flying is one of the most naturally dangerous things we have. You know, like in a car, you can just stop and pull over if something goes wrong. In a plane, there's no place to pull over. If something goes wrong, you have to keep going and, and keep going. So in that sense, what I'm here is to communicate both two things. One, giving you a bit of background about aviation and safety and the things that we've done as an aviation industry to try and fix that and improve to a frankly incredible safety record. And number two, how those kind of lessons and that kind of methodology applies to coding and programming, but in a way that doesn't necessarily slow you down too much. It just helps you write better software, you know, that, that kind of nice improvement that hopefully you can all take something away and learn from. But first of all, let's look at some safety stats. Now, many people are scared of flying, and I always tell them some version of this, where airlines, exactly, there are 0.2 fatal accidents per million hours of flying. Now, recently, there's been obviously a small group of them, but this is average over 10 years. And if you compare that to cars and trucks, you see that they are you know, considerably more safe. And the numbers vary slightly based on which year you pick, but it's generally always this kind of layout. But what you've got there as well as airlines is GA. Now, GA stands for general aviation. And what that means is all other flying that isn't commercial passenger flying. So for example, things like private pilots, helicopter inspections of power lines, you know, gen just general kind of like skydiving is in there, for example, everything else that isn't your standard airline flying a, flying a jet. And um, business jets are in general aviation, for example. And as you can see, the safety record for general aviation is much bigger than airlines because it's, you know, it's a much less experienced set of pilots generally. Um, the airlines have a much more bigger, more stringent safety records. But still, if you compare that with motorcycles, which, you know, naturally kind of dangerous as well, they're much less protected, they're still safer than motorcycles. And like, these are planes in the air. Like, motorcycles, obviously, they, it, they're unprotected, but you still see it's a lot better. And of those accidents in general aviation, about three quarters are caused by the pilot themselves. Um, this is one of the big problems aviation recognized very early on. Um, once we got over the mechanical failures, we realized that the pilots are generally the weak link in most aircraft. Not to the point where we can place them with computers, because we're not there yet, but there's a lot you can do to make the pilot be a safer, better pilot, and take away and learn from all this kind of stuff. So some of the common causes of accidents that we've learned over time, um, controlled flight into terrain. This is when a pilot can't see necessarily mount mountains in front of them and just flies level and then just flies straight in there. It's called controlled because they don't try and divert. Like if you can see the mountain, you obviously try and get away, but this is like you're in cloud, it hides a wall, yeah, not good. Disorientation in clouds, this is very, very common. Um, if you are not trained to fly in clouds, it's very disorienting. You're sort of mind and there's optical illusions happen where you have no idea which way up is. And so generally, I think it's, there's some very high percentage of pilots who they fly into clouds, they have no experience, they'll just come tumbling out the bottom because they've lost orientation. So that's very important to do. Um, and there's a whole separate license for flying without visual reference, so in clouds. And then thirdly, and possibly the, the most tragic, is bad decision making. Um, called, commonly called get their itis. This is when you're, you've flown for three hours of a four-hour flight, you're really close to your final airport, but there happens to be a small thunderstorm brewing nearby. Now, thunderstorms are really bad news for airplanes. There's lots of updrafts and downdrafts that toss planes around in not great manners. But you're like, well, I don't want to turn back. I don't want to divert. I don't want to get home. I just want to get there. It's probably fine. It's that kind of risk-taking that ends in very bad outcomes. But why do we know this? We know this because every single accident is investigated in great detail by the relevant authorities. Over the years, from about the 40s onwards, there's been investigation of every single accident. 
They're, the emission is so thorough, you know, like obviously commercial ones are thorough, but even small aircraft crashes are very thorough. There was one in the um, UK where this guy crashed a helicopter in the middle of a remote place called the, the Lake District. They went so far as to take the engine back to the manufacturer who could tell from the mud splatter inside which way the helicopter had landed. Like, you know, there's this incredible level of detail. And that kind of is something that I think we don't have in the industry as a whole. Like, we can take some of the lessons we've learned from those investigations and from that feedback loop and apply it into the idea of programming. And so I'm going to go through a, a series of kind of thinly veiled metaphors, but you'll see what I mean in a second, and sort of show you some of the ideas that we have in aviation, how they were solved, and then how those kind of apply to good programming methodologies. So first of all is soft failure. This is one of my biggest bugbears. Soft failure in programming is really annoying, but also in aviation. So in an aircraft, there are things like explicit disengage signals. So if my autopilot turns off, it doesn't just turn off. It sounds a really harsh beep in my head going, ah, when it turns off. So you really know it's gone. And not only that, if an instrument is inaccurate, so for example, if an electronic one fails, it doesn't just fail. It goes, oh, I'm weird, and puts a big red X through itself. If it's an analog one, as a pilot, you're told to cover it up with paper so you don't even see it. Like you, you're excluding them entirely from your vision. And mechanically, if a part shows even some sign of an issue that could be temp um, temperamental, it's immediately replaced. And what that turns into is a similar kind of thing with programming. Now, you may think soft failure is good, and it is in some cases. There are some applications when soft failure is very important. Often they are ones where, you know, the soft failure itself is going to stop something life critical happening. But in general programming, especially for the web, you want to crash hard on any serious error. What's far worse than the crash is a horrific bug that sits there brewing for years and years, going relatively unnoticed until finally you realize your data has been corrupted for the past you know, seven months or eight months or whatever. So make sure if there's anything that you shouldn't think would happen, put a, put a raise in there. Put a thing saying raise value error, raise runtime, well, not runtime error, but raise, you know, custom error exceptions so that they spew out, your system catches them, and then you immediately know a problem's happened. On top of that, don't trust any single system. Expect all your servers to lose power randomly. Um, even better, just do this yourself occasionally. You know, there's the famous chaos monkey. Um, you want to be able to design a system where you can just go and unplug something, and you have expected this. Like, expect your software to crash. Expect your servers to die. Build around that, and you'll find that suddenly, not only is it more reliable, but deploying is a lot easier because you can just deploy by killing all the processes and deploying them again, which is much easier than like soft restarts. Noisy warnings. This is another thing where in airplanes, there is a very limited number of warning sounds in the cockpit. Generally, I think four to five different things of what pilots can discern. Any more than that, and it's kind of an unobvious mush. And so they're very deliberately designed so that they are obvious and that you, when you hear them, you know what they mean. So for example, in an airliner or in a more modern small aircraft, when it's approaching the ground, it goes, terrain, terrain, in this very obvious voice that is, and the voice itself has this tone of urgency as well, which helps your mind go, oh, wait, that's somebody speaking to me in an urgent manner. And also, more importantly, there's no constant low-level warnings. Um, there's, I'm reading a few accident reports preparing this talk, and there's one interesting one where there is an examiner who helps crash an aircraft. Uh, he doesn't crash it, so they land with the gear up, and it's called a belly landing on the runway. And the reason he did this is because when the gear is up and the plane's coming down, there's a, there's a constant horn that sounds, the gear, the gear warning horn. It had been on for so long that he, his brain had blocked it out that even the examiner didn't realize the gear was up. And, it, and this horn was sounding the entire way down into approach and on landing, and neither the student or the examiner realized this, because they, they just filtered it out in their heads. And that's the same kind of thing for programming. If you have error logs that you see every day and delete, why do you have the error logs? Stop, stop those error logs. You want to have an error log that your goal is, whenever a line comes up, you want to go in there and fix that problem. If you're ignoring things for a week, then don't have them, delete them. Obviously, they're not important to you. You've already, you've already prioritized them. If they are sort of slow back burner bugs, make a ticket for them, but they shouldn't be in your own box. If you start ignoring all these bugs, you're going to start filtering out all the serious ones too. Like anything with a head that looks anything remote like a bug, you'll come in and go, oh, it's fine. It's just another bug. And then you'll suddenly start missing serious things. Poor testing. Now, Testing in aircraft is sometimes one of those scary things people don't fly. And in fact, 
I showed a coworker the video of a wing flex test before I came out here in the hopes of convincing her this is show how safe aircraft are. The immediate reaction is, of course, that it's not. Uh, so what happens in the, in the video is that they flex aircraft wings up to around 50, 60 degrees, and then the wing shatters. The point is not that it shatters. The point is that they know when it shatters. They know that the wing can bend to an insane. Uh, here's a picture of it. The wind can bend to, it, this, look, look at that. This is, a seven, eight, this is a 787 five years ago in testing phase. That wing is at more than 45 degrees. That never happens in real life, but they know exactly when that wing is going to break. And that's the kind of thing, like, everything is tested to destruction. They know when things are going to fail. Failure isn't just sort of, you know, a potential. It's a known, expected thing. And by getting ahead of the curve, you can sit there and work out when things are going to fail. And it should be the same in software. You should have tests that test when things fail. Tests that check things are working fine are fantastic. You know, unit tests, oh, it's all okay. But test your failure. You, like, your system will break, I guarantee you this. I can probably go into any system and break it given enough time. Um, but you should know when. What kind of latency breaks your system? What kind of memory corruption breaks your system? What if my network comes in and out randomly? All those kind of things. Like, what if your hardware is unreliable? What if your hard drive only responds one time in 10 to read commands? Like, you should be in there testing the failure cases as well as the success cases. And more importantly, the interaction of the whole system is as important as individual unit tests. A lot of people write unit tests and then just go, oh, I've tested all the things individually, it's fine. But a lot of the complexity is in the interaction. So you want to make sure you have the full stack tests in place, even some basic smoke tests, like can I log in, can I log out, can I make a ticket purchase, for example, for Eventbrite. Automation reliance is an interesting one. Now, obviously, modern aircraft, especially airliners, have very good autopilots. And generally, a um, modern airline pilot will do the takeoff, and the autopilot will do nearly everything down to the final part of the landing. Um, but they're not there for when it works well. The pilots are there for when it works badly. They're there to catch the cases the computer doesn't expect. Um, and for this reason, the plane and the autopilot usually advise and very rarely ever take away control from the pilot. So even with the autopilot on in my aircraft, I can still, it moves a stick, but I can still forcefully push the stick and override it. The actuator is deliberately weaker than I am, so I can always take control of the aircraft. And similarly, like if there's something going to happen like the terrain warning, the plane will tell you about it, but it won't necessarily take any action. It, it might be wrong, and automation is wrong. But what's important is that you're not reliant on it. And so pilots are regularly tested with all of the automation turned off. Um, in fact, so here is a cockpit similar to the one I fly. Um, this is a very fancy one. There are two big, nice screens here rather than lots of dials, so yay for that. But you were tested with all of this stuff is not there. And if you, see, if you can see barely, there's three dials down here. Those are your backup ones. You need to be able to land on those three alone. And so it's not just testing that the computers work, it's testing that you can do things without the computers. And in software, what that tends to be is that you don't want to rely on magical automatic failover. Now, as a, as a sort of rough test, how many of you heard of a system that claims to be magically fail over, like it magically makes it heals itself? How many of you heard one of these? Yeah, there we go, quite a few of you. Um, some of them are true, some of the time. Um, I have lost data to ones that claim to do this. Uh, do trust them, but always have a backup plan. Like, software is never magic. Something will always fail it can't deal with. So not only have a plan, Regularly practice, say once every couple of months, your backup plan. Know how to manually switch databases to, for di to a different replica, for example. Know how to go restore from a backup. Like, if you've never restored from backup, how do you know it works? You should practice in that system so that when time comes, you're so well drilled in doing that thing that you can come and go, OK, we've done this, we've practiced this, you know, we, we have the instructions written down. And in that note, the, the flip side of this is people reliance. A lot of, especially small early companies, rely too much on institutional knowledge and their people. In particular, they rely on sort of people, oh, you know, that person over there, they know how to deploy. Um, or, oh yeah, well, you know, we can only run it on this person's machine, but that's fine, because we're a small company. And <laughs> you don't have to automate everything up front, but having explicit stuff written down is good. And so in aviation, how this happens is there are checklists for everything. So here is a checklist. This is just the startup procedure for the, for the small aircraft I fly. Like, 747 would be way bigger. Uh, you can see there's, you know, at least 100-ish different things on that checklist. Um, I can probably remember all of them, 
but I don't want to have to remember all of them, because like, if you forget, say, um, where's the one? There's fuel both right here. That small line, if you forget that one, you have half the range of your fuel tanks. You know? um, if you forget something like, where are we? If you forget to turn the fuel pump off here, then you're, the engine might cut out during takeoff, because you'll be flooded with fuel and things like that. So it's very important that you follow through all of these. And that's why they're written down explicitly. That's why you follow them. Having somebody remember these would be silly. And so for anything critical, there's these checklists. And there's also warnings about common things pilots get wrong. So for example, you know, pilots often, um, one of the common illusions is not knowing which level you are. Because in a cloud, your brain and your inner ear kind of correct for turns and gravity in a very strange way. And so that's why several instruments in the cockpit show you the level in a very obvious way so that you can look at them all the time and go, oh, actually, I'm not where I thought it was. I'm correct for it. And also, a very important thing in flying is workload. Now, workload refers to how busy a pilot is. Generally, they're very low workload when they're sort of cruising at altitude because the plane's flying itself. There's nothing to worry about, really. But during landing, it's a very high workload time. And there have been cases and crashes where people and the crashes happened because the workload was so high that nobody in the cockpit noticed the problem. And by the time, they're too distracted with something else. And so how this, in my opinion, invests in software is if you're not going to automate releases, at least have a, check, a basic checklist for them. Things like, have we pushed out you know, the release notes? Have we tagged it properly? Have we run the tests? Have we checked on all these other platforms we support? And more than that, there are some common tasks you should automate. Like automation of some things is very tough, but automation of some very simple things can save you a lot of time. And it may seem like an upfront investment, but it's one of those ones that you really don't want to accrue technical debt in that one, because not only is it technical debt, it's person debt. And if somebody leaves the company with that knowledge in their head, you're set back far too far. Finally, again, reduce workload at critical times. You should make it so your site's worst moments are when the most automation is ready and waiting. And they don't happen very often. So that's a bit weird to plan for. But things like you know, a manual database failover, it should probably still be manual if you're small. You don't have enough people to write a fully automatic one. But make it a manual script. Make it one or two commands. Don't make it half an hour of SSHing into the server and just copying files randomly and hoping it works. Because trust me, that doesn't end well. Bad priorities. And this is an interesting one. Now, this, this top sort of statement here is a very common one. Aviate, navigate, communicate. It's taught to all students very early on in their training. What it means is, in any problem, ignore everything else and fly the plane. Don't care where you're going. Don't care about talking to air traffic control. Just fly the plane. Because a lot of students, and you'll see this very often, I did this too, um, they'll get in a bit of a tears. They'll be like, because you know, radio communication is hard to learn. And it's a bit you know, worrisome at the start. You'll be sort of trying to talk to ATC and trying to get the right vocabulary. And then suddenly you realize the plane is like in a left bank and starting to dive. And your instructor's like, corrects it and goes, hey, you know, fly the plane. Don't sit there and focus. So it's very important to focus on the things that are important. And also, in this case, there's a thing called a minimum equipment list. Now, this is the list of things on an aircraft that must be working for it to take off. Um, now, you know, we, don't, we accept that not everything on the plane must be working to take off. But there is a minimum basic set of very core things, like engines and wings, for example, that must be there. Um, and he here's a little quiz for you all. Here are six things. Passenger video screens, lavatory ashtrays, fuel receptacle caps, air conditioning, seatbelt signs, and weather radar. Now, three of these are critical and in the minimum equipment list for a 747. And three of these are non-critical. Now, some of these are very famous. Um, I'll show you the, the answers here. So the lavatory ashtrays are a critical part of the aircraft. If you cannot see an ashtray from a lavatory that is functional, you cannot take off. Um, this dates back because like, even though smoking is banned, if you are smoking, they want somewhere for you to put it out. And obviously, fire is very bad. Um, the fuel receptacle caps literally are not important. Um, there's two caps. So the, out, the outermost one can be off. And it just, the, the guide says, as long as you check inside to get rid of any dust when you refill it, that's fine. You know, they're not that important. Air conditioning, very important because that's what keeps it above minus 40 degrees Celsius. Um, Seatbelt signs, there must be a visible one that's working from every seat. So it can be off if no one's sitting behind it, but that's unlikely. Weather radar, not necessary. You can just to ask controllers. It's a nice thing to have, but not, e not every aircraft has it. So as long as your route doesn't require it, it's fine. And like, obviously, passive video screens, they, the airlines don't care about you. You're just travelers to them. 
Um, the last thing here is Mayday Priority. Now, this is where if you have an emergency, then what will happen is every other piece of traffic or aircraft on the same radio channel as you has to shut up. If Air Force One is on the same channel as you, they have to shut up if you have an emergency. There's this big priority about this stuff. And you know what this is is that they're making it very clear that there are certain things that matter and certain things that don't. And an interesting case of this is Margaret Hamilton. Now, Margaret Hamilton was the lead software engineer for the Apollo 11 program. In particular, she, and that, that's her standing there with the Apollo 11's guidance computer programming code, that stack of paper. And one of the very important things she did is she made a system that knew about priorities. And famously, on the descent of Apollo 11, the two astronauts in the lander mistakenly turn on one of the radars. And that causes too many interrupts in the main computer and causes it to run out of cycles. It can no longer handle everything. And suddenly it starts going haywire. And her programming went, OK, the landing system's a higher priority and just shut down the non-essential stuff. And because of that programming, the moon landing was successful. If it wasn't for that sensible prioritization of tasks, they probably would have had to abort and return, return to orbit. How does that? sort of overall comes programming, you should know what your critical features are. Like, you have parts of the site that are really important. For us at Eventbrite, buying tickets is very important. Our social features, slightly less so. We'd like them to work, but we'd much rather you can buy tickets and payments work correctly as a number one priority. What can you do without? There are certain things that, if they're not there, oh, it's probably fine. For example, if your web fonts don't load, that's probably fine if you've got a backup. So know what you want to fix first and test most. If a really bad outage happens, know what you're going in straight away for, and know what you're going to come back and go, well, this is less important. It's not crucial to the site. We can sort of circle back and fix that later. Now, unclear responsibility is a very big and kind of recent development in aviation. Now, what happened was there was a series of crashes in around about the 80s where the crashes were because the captain wasn't listening to the co-pilot of the crew. And so there's a big thing called multi-cockpit sort of multi training where it's made clear that one person's always in command and the other one's always listened to. And what's very important is clear, concise communication. If you have a problem, you can tell the person in command and they should listen to you, but you shouldn't argue and they shouldn't just ignore you. And it's a big part of training. That's very important. And that kind of funds into management of software. So I've seen a lot where managers sort of hand down these arbitrary decisions from on high they never listen to anybody feeding up, back up the chain. And specifications are very unclear. So clear, concise you know, information. And at the end of the day, somebody makes key decisions. But knowing who that person is, obviously, it's like you know, pin somebody who makes decisions, and then make sure others are listened to. But you know, there's one person making decisions. There's not committees. It's not slow. There's no like, shifting of the blame. And talking of blame, blame culture is another cause of accidents. Um, when, some, when they're investigating a crash, they never blame a single person. Accidents and incidents are always a combination of factors, always. There is never one thing. And so realizing that not only is there multiple factors, but blaming souls and nothing is very important. You should, you know, if you have a problem on a site or with some code, it's not one person's fault. And don't blame them, because they're probably the best person to go and fix it if they know the code. You should work together, find all the factors. Like, perhaps there was some bad Git configuration, or perhaps there was some distractions at work. You know, perhaps it's the working environment. Perhaps it's the technology. But there's always a combination. And try and solve the whole. Don't pick one person and single them out. That's never going to work well. And finally, deadlines. Um, planes don't do deadlines. They carry extra fuel. They always have an alternate. And you're told, and obviously, you'd much rather land safely than where you were originally intending to land. Um, you know, for example, I was flying to Miami recently, and Air Force One, that wonderful plane we keep coming up about, um, happened to be up Miami blocking all traffic. And so rather than sit there and circle with not quite enough fuel, the captain, sensibly, decided to land at Fort Lauderdale, get more fuel, so they could safely sit there around for circle. It's always about safety. And deadlines are there to be sort of chained if you can, but softly broken otherwise. And so, similarly with software, don't schedule everyone at maximum. Like, always expect unknown problems, and ship good code rather than on time, please. Like, the person who ships good code and then spends a week fixing it, and sort of like staying late and being the heroic person who fixes all the code late, is actually much worse than the person who ships a code a week late, but ships it perfectly. So, you know, recognize that. Now, sort of four key takeaways for you here. First of all, checklists. Um, this is my one favorite thing about uh, flying. I have made checklists for far too many things in my personal life. Um, that's 
partly me and partly everything, but they're a really good first step of automation. Like, think about those. Secondly, filter unimportant errors. Another big thing I've seen a lot of companies, like people have built up, like, especially new employees, because the old ones have got filters that stop everything. The new employees are like, oh, we, they join the company and this flood of email has their inbox. They're like, what is this? So please keep on top of your errors. Third, pick your key features. Work out what's important to your site. Prioritize those. If you go down, know what you're going to fix first. Don't spend equal amounts of time fussing over minor features. And finally, reward good decisions. The people who stay late fixing, fixing fires, sometimes they're great, sometimes it's their own fault. Prioritize those people who make good decisions and sometimes ship late, but they ship really good code. And one final word, operations are like pilots because their life is boredom punctuated by moments of terror. Thank you. We have a brief time for questions, I believe. All right, thanks very much, Andrew. Yeah, um, we've got time for a few questions. There's a mic here in the middle of the room, and I've got one. If you can't make it to here, just try and flag me down. Andrew, I'm a fellow private pilot in a week, hopefully, if <laughs> I uh, pass my check ride. Uh, I had another phrase I wanted to maybe get your thoughts about, which is it's better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you were on the ground. Yeah. So how would that play in with uh, unit tests or integration tests? So not every metaphor can be construed to code, as I found out writing this talk. <laughs> um, I think my interpretation of that would be it's much rather to ship. I think that's a more security thing. Right? It's much better to ship secure software late than ship unsecure software. I mean, especially recently, there's been a string of security holes. Like OSX happened like yesterday, for example. So you know, that's much more a don't ship this broken piece of software that will cause reputation issues or security holes if you can spend a few more weeks just fixing it up, or a few more days, or a few more hours even. Yeah, that's my interpretation. OK, great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to add one thing in that the little nagging emails you get constantly about problems that you filter out, they're still problems. Yes. So one way of addressing that, I learned at Sig Chi a number of years ago, you go, there's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. Hey, there's still a problem right, yeah. every now and again. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the continuity that's a problem. If it's every month, then you'll go, oh, it's the month. There's, this thing's happened. But yeah, it's, it's filtering out. Yeah, fun talk. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the difference between postmortems of features that go well and postmortems of features that don't go as well? I think there shouldn't be much difference. Um, obviously, things that don't go well, you've got, a lot, you've got different factors in place. You've got things like reputation and stuff. But at the end of the day, they're both very complicated systems with lots of factors. And you want to identify just as much the factors that played in things going well as the ones that went badly. And I almost argue that things that go well should have more investigation because if it went well, that's a really good thing. We should work out what's going on and why we should be doing this more. Um, I thought it was really interesting how you broke down the difference between like the small uh, like small small airplanes, people like individuals, pilots, and stuff like that, and airlines. Mm -hmm. What are the things? Can you go a little bit into like what the differences are? Like, where does that delta come from between those? And like, what are the things right. as an individual pilot that you kind of like wish maybe that you could do like an airline? Because there's a lot of tests, you know, a lot of infrastructure like practices that I'd like yeah. to do like this that we can't because we don't have the resources or time. So the majority of it is cost. Um, cost comes in two factors. Maintenance is done slightly less. Maintenance is pretty good generally, actually, even on small aircraft, but experience as well. So as a private pilot, I have like 120, 30 hours of experience. Um, a captain on a jet must have at least 1,500 hours and probably more. Um, so that's one of the major courses. But also, you know, big, big aircraft have much more safety systems. They have better autopilots. It's just, they're just ahead of the curve. And as, you know, as you saw there, small aircraft are getting like the nice screens, we're getting autopilots, it's, and they're filtering through. And in fact, light aircraft crashes go down pretty much every year. Like, there's continuous downslope on that graph. But at the end of the day, people flying privately, cost is still a, big, a much bigger factor than the airlines. Um, so that's one of the main reasons, I think. Nice talk. Um, who's the best people or best team or Best group to work on um, postmortems of a, of a like the, your OSX uh, bug that you said that you just found out about yesterday. Is it people within the organization? Is it you know external people? You know, I, 
I want to see how you balance that versus against like a deadline culture. So I actually find that new and junior programmers are very valuable for that kind of thing because they're untied by experience. Um, programmers, who, especially if they worked on the code in question that failed, they will be somewhat tied to its demise and some sense of, but like a new programmer, in, in ways not like a small child, but they're much better at this, um, will go and say, that's wrong, what are you doing here? And, and you should enable them to do that, don't suppress them. Like, if somebody comes to your organization who's like fresh from somewhere else, then they're probably experienced even if they're just new to your company, and go, why are you doing it like this? Don't tell them, oh, it's always been that way. There's probably a good reason why they're questioning it. Like, so I think them, and a, like, you know, a combination of fresh eyes and old eyes to sort of seal corners is a good combination. As for what team, it varies in organization. Like, you know, Eventbrite has 100 in years, other people have less, have even more, so hard to say. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I'd just like to say thanks again, Andrew, and let's uh, thank the speaker one more time. And Thank you. Excellent.